fingernails on a chalkboard, someone slurping the last drops of a nearly empty cup, maybe the imperial march as Darth Vader enters into a room. I don't know. Do any of them elicit the same physical, emotional response as a baby crying? Babies, for their part, are quick to learn how much power they have over us with their wails and their protests. I mean, within days, if not hours, they have us jumping at every whine and whimper, if for no other reason than to avoid the full-blown screams they use to alert us to their needs. It's fun to remember personally, to remember those days of my own parenting. But now, and let me be honest, fun would not have been a word I would have used when I was smack dab in the middle of those days. Thankfully, the soul-piercing cries of infants don't last forever. At least, they're not meant to. Thinking about what it is to become people of faith... The Apostle Paul writes much of our Newer Testament, draws parallels from the phases of life that we experience when he writes to new believers in this place that we know as Corinth. From the message paraphrase, again, not a direct translation of the letter we have that Paul writes to the Corinthians, but from the message paraphrase, here Paul offer his insights in 1 Corinthians 13, the 11th through the 13th verse. When I was an infant at my mother's breast, I gurgled and cooed like any infant. When I grew up, I left those infant ways for good. We don't see things clearly. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist. But it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then, see it as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly as he knows us. But for right now, until that completeness, we have three things to do to lead us toward that consummation. Trust steadily in God. Hope unswervingly. Love extravagantly. And the best of the three is love. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. Most of the times I've tried telling someone quit being a baby, it didn't go well. So why does Paul start this part of his pastoral advice to the believers in Corinth with essentially these very words? I can't say for certain. I do know, however, that he has a way of getting our attention, and perhaps that's what he's doing here. He's so committed to sharing the message that he's not afraid to poke the Corinthians, and and I think by extension us, to maybe say something in a way that, that might slow us down, maybe slow us down enough that we could hear what comes next. So what is it in this part of the letter that Paul thinks is so important? Two things jump out to me. The first being that discipleship, learning to live like Jesus, involves maturing over time. And the second goes this way, that no matter how much we learn, there is still, there will always be much that we simply don't know. Taking this first idea, maturing over time is something that we are very aware of right now as I'm speaking with you here. This is a time, a season, where many of our young people are preparing to graduate high school. Even in the context of this faith community that I'm a part of, we have an early childhood program. And and again, we celebrate a graduation from the, the end of that program as students prepare for what's next. Early childhood program students readying for that next step of kindergarten, even as high school students are preparing for college or trade school or some other job. It's really amazing to me how much happens between those two events, right? Getting ready for kindergarten and graduating high school. For many, this is a time of of noticeable development, that period of time. Physically, the changes are, are drastic, 
mentally and emotion, emotionally, the, the changes are, are just as, as impactful. Paul talks about this gurgling and cooing, but that phase of life is relatively short. Before long, infants become toddlers who become graduates. We know the process doesn't stop there. Our entire lives are marked by changes in who we are and how we look and what we do. But with that said, there's a difference between growing older and maturing. We like to think wisdom comes with age, but that's not always the case. It's not a foredrawn conclusion. Ask my wife, and she will give you evidence that in many ways, I'm a 15-year-old trapped in a 51-year-old body. The point I think that Paul is making is not that we should fondly remember the development of our young people. It's a reminder that as people of faith, we too start out dependent upon others, gurgling and cooing as we are fed and cared for, fussing when we are not. Like our physical growth, that phase is meant to be short-lived. Over time, we expect a maturing in faith, just as we hope that in time, we mature physically and emotionally and mentally. As I've noted a number of times in the context of preaching, just showing up to a class or a discussion or even worship does not necessarily correlate to maturity. By that, I, I mean I don't think maturity just happens if enough time passes. Maturity is about choices. It's about habits and patterns and practices. It's living in intentional ways. When it comes to our spiritual maturity, this may be especially true. We can be exposed to the stories of faith. We can see others live Christ-centered lives. We can even join with others in worship and prayer and service. We can do all these things and still find our hearts unchanged. Our thoughts could be just as self-centered. At some point, I believe we are invited to come to this threshold of spiritual infancy. Will we remain a spiritual infant, one who needs constant care and attention? Or will we step over that threshold to become a mature follower of Jesus? One who learns how to feed oneself and, and care for others. We get to make that choice. We get to make that decision. And notice when I, when I talk about this, I hope you hear me talk about it as a process. Not that one day we're an infant and the next day we're mature. This is a maturing. It's a process of growth. When our graduates leave the nests, whether, whether they're leaving an early childhood programming or, or leaving a high school, when our graduates graduate to what's next, they have plenty left to learn. There's much that's obscured and difficult to discern. Almost like looking through a fog, Paul suggests. We get glimpses, you know, hints, shadows of potential, glimmers of possibility. A job offer emerges and perhaps we give it a try. A relationship gives us a taste of what we might want in a future partnership. A class or a training reveals an interest that we grow excited to pursue further. Right? We graduate from one thing, but that doesn't mean the story ends or the process comes to completion. There's more to be revealed. We just see little, little bits and pieces. We can't see very far into the future. So all along, we proceed with humility. Because as we mature, we discover the more we know, the more there is to learn. I think this is Paul's second point, that we'll never have it all figured out. In the context of, of our faith, I, I know this to be true. We read scripture and come away with new questions, which can lead to even more study. We graduate from one stage to find a whole new stage opening before us. Every opportunity in faith leads us to a deeper life of faith that we find becomes more expansive with every step we take. Now, some might be discouraged by that description of a life of faith, growing in faith. There's never an end. But I think this is great news 
The infinite God desires to be known, but infinite means without end. There will always be more to discover, more that can be revealed, more of God to delight in, more of God to celebrate and to share. Can that be overwhelming? Yes, and it should be. Because God is awesome and amazing and wonderful and more than we could know or imagine. So graduation for us spiritually is graduating to what's next. It's infants become toddlers, who become adolescents, who become adults, who keep growing. And spiritually, we could understand a similar process. I've been told that physically... Our noses and our ears never stop growing. Even when you reach a certain height, you know, where you reach the height that you're going to be your whole life, your nose keeps growing. Now, friends, I got to tell you, I don't need a bigger nose, right? I've already got a big enough nose. But a stronger, deeper, more robust faith? Yes, please, let that continue to grow in and through me. Well, where would I start? Where would you start? The question many of our graduates, graduates are and will be, I mean, that, that's the question they're wrestling with now. When I went to K-State orientation with my daughter, the adults were separated from the children because th- this is a major step in them becoming an adult, right? So almost immediately, they begin making decisions that will guide the rest of, of their experience at the university, And so they separated us. And as I sat uh, going through the orientation, listening to the presentations, looking over a list of possible majors that would also be being, being shared with my daughter, right alongside education and business, veterinary medicine was undecided. There was actually a major called I don't know. Friends, I, I think that this is a good thing. It's a recognition that our young people, many of them will start whatever's next for them without a clear picture of what they want to be when they grow up, right? I want to say the same is true for us spiritually. We don't have to have it all figured out. We can't have it all figured out. So let's just take the next step in faith, right? Undecided, undeclared. I don't really know, but I'm going to stumble forward in faith. Trusting that God will be continually revealed to me. So what areas might we, might we be undecided in? How, how might we proceed? Paul wants to be practical here. He wants to give us some, some guardrails, right? So it's not anything goes, but, but, but maybe gives us some direction. So again, back in Corinthians If we don't have any real clue of of what might be next, Paul wants to offer us a little career counseling. What areas could we focus on as we step over this threshold from infancy to maturity? He says, trust steadily in God. That could be something you'd major in. Hope unswervingly. That could be a path. Love extravagantly. In other translations, we understand these to be faith, hope, and love, right? And if you thought of those as kind of big categories for how we might think about our relationship with God and how we might proceed in a relationship of growing closer to God, faith, hope, and love. And he says, remember, the best of these is love. Maybe that's where we need to focus. Maybe that would be helpful for you, helpful for me. So if you're going to love your family, love your neighbor, love the one who looks and acts differently than you as well. Love the outcast. Love your enemy. These are all places and all ways in which we might grow deeper in faith. If you're already loving your family, how might that love grow? If you're already loving your neighbor, how might you express that love more fully? If you're already loving your enemies, what is a one way that you could allow that love to become even, even more, even greater? In other words, whatever stage we find ourselves in, right, even if we, even if we take these steps to become more loving, we can graduate to another step, a next step. There's always going to be more for us to grow into, a next level, if you will. Again, graduation, after all, isn't the end of the story. 
but the beginning of a new adventure, a new chapter, a new journey. So if you're attending worship, maybe join a group. And if you're in a group, maybe invite somebody to come along with you. And if you've already invited somebody to come along with you, maybe you could consider leading a new group. If you're praying for your neighbors, maybe you can engage your neighbor in a conversation. If you're already talking with your neighbors, maybe invite them to share a meal. If you invite them to share a meal and you begin eating with your neighbors, maybe you could listen for ways to serve them. Perhaps you volunteer at a school or in a children's ministry. And then when you do that, maybe you'll come alongside a family that you could pray for. You're already praying for a family? Great. Find a way to help them win at home. If you are already helping them win at home, celebrate those wins with them. You see, the point I'm trying to make here is wherever we're at, whatever we're currently doing, we want to consider what would be a possible next step. What would be another thing we could grow into? What might it look like for us to take what we're doing now and make it more? Right? So we mature in our faith. We take these steps deeper in love. We think about the ways in which we grow closer to Christ, become more and more like Jesus. I mean, after all, Jesus said it first. Paul writes it down later, and I'm reminding us now the most important lesson for us, the, the, the thing that we want to learn the most here is how to love. And we're going to, I pray, keep learning that. We're going to keep loving. We're going to practice with the students that are graduating this year, or perhaps they've graduated recently. Those, I mean, just think about the, the students in your life, perhaps, or the young people around you. They might not think they need it. But as a guy who left high school for the wilderness that awaited, it was the lifelines thrown to me by people of faith who found practical ways to encourage me and support me that kept me grounded, it kept me connected, and which became a crumb trail for me to follow back to God. That's not really about age or a moment in time, not just about a high school graduate. It's about caring for one another. So I say practice that with these people who have recently graduated. But friends, this is the kind of opportunity we have with all of our relationships. Because it, maturing, it turns out, is hard work. Growing in faith is difficult. It's filled with ups and downs. Getting it right only to find that you've messed it all up. Which is why many don't do it. It's just easier, I think, however. We have more a chance at success if we know that there are others rooting for us, others cheering us on. So maybe growing up in faith is something we could practice together. After all, love connects us to God. Isn't it meant to connect us to one another? I believe it is. And so I invite you to join me into praying that we might mature together. We might grow together. We might serve together. We might learn to love together. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, Paul wrote these words to a, a church trying to figure out how to take next steps in faith. And God, I pray for the men, the women, the children that might be trying to take those next steps now. That as we think about the ways in which we're called to mature in our faith, that if we find that there's a way in which we've been crying as an infant, that God, you help somebody come into our lives that can, that can take care of us, until we are able to grow and stand on our own. But God, when that time comes, let us take this, these, these steps in faith as we mature into a deeper love of you. That we might not only begin to feed ourselves, we might begin to help care for one another. I pray all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.